Hi everyone, welcome to our June workshop and this month we'll be talking about insights and strategies for super sleep. I know the weather's getting colder and it's actually getting harder to uh, or sometimes even fall asleep or wake up and get out of bed but sometimes outside of weather it's a, it's a bit more than that so today we'll be talking about sleep. So I'll be sharing my powerpoint. Can you see my PowerPoint there? Yeah. Thank you. All right. Awesome. So welcome again. So for those of you who don't know, I'm Dr. Cindy. I'm a chiropractor here at Provision Health in Queenbeam, working alongside Dr. Marcus. And today we'll be talking about insights and strategies for super sleep. What we'll be discussing in further detail is we're talking about what is considered healthy sleep in the first place. We'll talk about some common conditions and sleep disorders for that and how you can identify them and as well as what can you do about your sleep as well from a natural perspective so how you can develop good sleep hygiene as well as natural ways so without further ado what is considered healthy sleep so a healthy sleep is when an adult should have uh, seven to nine hours of sleep per night because this duration allows for sufficient rest and recovery this healthy sleep also includes the ability to fall asleep within a reasonable time frame, as difficulties in falling asleep may indicate an underlying sleep disorder or condition that needs to be addressed. A key aspect of healthy sleep is experiencing minimal interruptions during the night because frequent awakenings can disrupt the sleep cycle, which we'll talk about more later, and affect your overall sleep quality. Healthy sleep also includes uh, having deep sleep, uh, deep sleep stages, also known as a slow wave sleep, because deep sleep promotes physical restoration, memory consolidation, and also overall brain health. Having healthy sleep leads to waking up feeling more refreshed, rejuvenated, and also ready for the day. If you consistently wake up feeling tired or groggy, it may indicate insufficient or poor quality sleep, which can also even sometimes ruin your day as well. Maintaining a sleep uh, schedule that is consistent is also essential for healthy sleep because when you go to bed and you wake up regularly at the same consistent time, it also helps regulate the body's internal clock and therefore promotes better sleep quality as well. So the next thing I want to talk about is four stages of sleep. Um, this just will provide greater insight into what sleep happens during the night as well. So when it comes to sleep, there are, as you can see here, four stages. It's, this includes uh, one stage of rapid eye movement sleep. Stand, uh, a shortcut is REM, and then the other three are non-REM sleep. So these stages are determined based on an analysis of your brain during uh, sleep, which then shows distinct patterns that characterize each stage. So your non-REM sleep, your N-REM, or you can say N1, N2, N3, there are three stages and the higher stage, the higher the stage of NREM sleep, the harder it is to wake someone up. So stage one, N1, is essentially when a person first falls asleep. So this stage normally lasts just one to seven minutes. And during the N1 sleep, the body hasn't fully relaxed at all, though the body and the brain activities start to slow down um, with brief movements, right? And there are light changes in the brain activity associated with falling asleep in this stage. So it's easy to wake someone up when they're only in N1, but if a person's not disturbed, they can move quickly onto stage two, N2. Um, and as the night unfolds, an uninterrupted sleeper may not actually spend much sleep at all in stage one because they go into stage two quickly. So during stage two, you can see it's much bigger. This is when the body enters a more skip and subdued state, including when the drop in the body's temperature, uh, the muscles of the body also relax more, the breathing rate is slower, and then the heart rate also slows down as well. This person is now in a bit of deeper sleep. So at the same time, the brain waves show a new pattern, and then the eye movements stop as well. So 
the brain activity slows down, but at the same time, there are still short bursts of brain activity that actually help resist being woken up by uh, external factors and stimulants. So this phase can last for 10 to 25 minutes um, during the first sleep cycle. And each time you have N2 stage, it can become longer and longer during the night. So collectively, a person typically spends about half of their sleep time in N2 sleep. Which is why you can see on this high graph here, it makes up a bigger amount. The next uh, and last non-REM sleep stage is N3. And this is deep sleep. This is when it's harder to wake someone up if they're in this phase. So the muscle tone, the pulse, and the breathing rate decreases even further. And then this is when the body even relaxes more. So the brain activity during this period has an identifiable pattern, identifiable pattern um, which is what's known as delta waves. So for this reason, stage three may also be called delta sleep or slow wave sleep, which is what I was speaking about earlier. Um, and in this stage, experts believe that it's critical for restorative sleep, which allows the body to recover and grow. Um, during this phase of sleep, this stage, in three, it may also improve the body's immune system and allow for other bodily processes to also take place. So even though the brain activity is reduced, there is evidence that deep sleep contributes to insightful thinking, creativity, and memory. So you spend the most time in deep sleep during the first half of the night and during the early sleep cycles, N3 stages commonly last for 20 to 40 minutes. And as you continue sleeping, these stages get shorter and more time gets uh, spent in REM sleep instead. So last but not least, during your REM sleep, so your rapid eye movement sleep, your brain activity now starts to pick up and at nearing levels which are similar to when you're awake and conscious. So at the same time, the body experiences atonia, which is a temporary paralysis of the muscles with only two exceptions, the eyes and the muscles that control breathing, which is why it's called rapid eye movement stage. So even though the eyes are closed, uh, they can be seen moving quickly, which is how, like I said, the stage gets its name. And they say REM sleep is believed to be essential for cognitive functions like your memory, your learning, and creativity. But it's also known for vivid dreams to occur. And this is because there's a significant uptake in the brain activity. And you know that dreams occur uh, in any stage of sleep, right? But the, when it's most intense, it is during the uh, rapid eye movement sleep, which is when you would wake up and rem actually remember part of your dream. So under normal circumstances, you don't have to enter a REM sleep stage until you have been asleep for about 90 minutes. But as the night goes on, REM stages get longer and especially in the second half of the night. So whilst the first time you go through a REM stage may only be short, can like, could be a few minutes um, or like up to one hour, the later stages you go through REM will can uh, last much longer. And so they say on average for adults, your REM sleep makes up about a quarter or 25% of your sleep cycle. Yeah, so that was a bit uh, in depth, but I hope you learned something new about what actually happens and what takes place when you're sleeping. So the next thing I wanna talk about is some common sleep disorders and what are the signs and symptoms um, in these conditions. So the first condition is insomnia. So insomnia happens when someone has to fully fall into sleep or even on the opposite is staying asleep. They either wake up too early or they're unable to fall back asleep. That lead, then leads to during the day, they have extreme fatigue and irritability and then leads to difficulty concentrating as well. Another common sleep condition is sleep apnea. And this is when someone uh, during the night, they snore a lot. They also gasp for air like as well. Or sometimes to another extent, they also can even choke in their sleep as well. So during the night, they have frequent pauses in their breathing during the sleep, which then leads to poor quality of sleep. And then during the day, they're tired. Uh, they can even have headaches swimming back. Another common condition is restless leg syndrome. So this is when the, if someone has uh, 
urge, but they can't control to move their legs when they're lying down or sitting still. So they can also experience uncomfortable sensations in their legs, such as tingling or even itchiness, even though like or ants falling, even though there's nothing actually happening there. This can also then lead to difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep. And once again, similarly to insomnia and sleep apnea, they then become tired during the day. So these are, I just spoke about, yeah. Sorry, for someone. So I just spoke about three common conditions of sleep. Um, you may find that you might have one of them, might be a bell for you, but I want to get into the nuts and bolts of things, which is about how to, you can develop good sleep hygiene because um, for some conditions, medical intervention is absolutely necessary, but having a good sleep hygiene can take you a long way. So first and foremost, something you can do is stick to a consistent sleep schedule. So if you have consistency in your sleep schedule, it will help your body regulate the internal blood flow. And then because of that, you can establish a predictable sleep routine. So speaking of routine, you also want to create a consistent but relaxing bedtime routine. So a bedtime routine signals to your body that it's time to wind down and prepare for sleep, and then it promotes relaxation. It can also even reduce stress and enhance sleep quality. So your routine needs to be not only consistent, but also personalized for you. So do whatever and choose whatever works best for you. So some examples can be for relaxation, it could be um, practicing breath work, uh, mindfulness, meditation, whether it be you like to have a warm bath or a shower, um, or alternatively, you could read a light book, something that doesn't, um, it's not too adventurous and you really need to get thinking, but something light or listening to gentle music, or if you're into writing, even journaling down, you know, your thoughts for the day to clear your mind. Something else you can do is you can create, you want to create a comfortable sleep environment. So there's a lot of factors that um, define and makes up comfortable, and it's also subjective as well, but something, things you can consider is controlling the temperature of your bedroom, um, so that it's cool, but also comfortable. You don't want to be too hot or too cold. And if you have good temperature, it will also go hand in hand with having good air circulation. So um, during the day, what you can consider is leaving the window open a bit for fresh air, or alternatively, if it's too cold, then you can look at getting an air purifier um, to create good air, good air circulation. Something else is noise. You want to minimize the amount of noise disturbances in your environment. So whether it be, uh, you could even sleep with earplugs if you know your partner, your husband or wife is a heavy snorer as well. Um, you also want to invest in a good quality mattress but, or, and pillow. This is because you spend a lot of your day, uh, it's quite obvious not that you spend a lot of your day in your bed. So you want to make sure that you really invest in something that's comfortable and supports your body and your spine. Just have to put that in there as a chiropractor. Um, so on the topic of bed, your bed sheets, um, your pillowcases, you also want them to be clean and made out of fabrics and materials that are breathable um, and also comfortable on your skin as well. So if you want to consider natural um, natural materials like cotton and linen are quite breathable. Yeah. And last but not least, uh, as you can see in this photo, it, the room is quite simple. You also want to have a room that's not only clean, but also decluttered and keep the distractions away from you. You want to remove any distractions and unnecessary items. Yeah. And that can all contribute to having a more comfortable sleep environment. Next is you want to be minimizing your light exposure at night time. So minimizing your light at night, the light that you look at at night time can help promote better sleep quality by supporting the body's natural sleep processes. And then it also enhances your ability to fall asleep as well. So you can see in this photo, this person is just wearing an eye mask um, to cover their eyes, but it doesn't, you don't really have to do that. What, you, what I'd recommend you focus on is looking at around you in your environment at the sources of light 
So the sources of light can include electronic devices, such as like your phone, your iPad, tablet, the computer, um, the TV, like, or like the, even the heater, just that little dot as well can like shine light through like the panel where you control the temperature. But outside of electronic lights, you also have the light in the room. So you want to make sure that in your bedroom, you don't have LED bulbs and you don't have like really bright uh, light bulbs as well. And then outside of your bedroom, you have to factor in uh, the street lights are too bright for you as well. So could it be that you wake up um, past sunrise and if your blindness aren't good um, and blocking the lights, every single morning you'll be woken up way too early from the lights from the street. So during uh, the night time, during the night, you want to make sure that you know you actually properly close your curtains, for example. And as for um, the electronic devices, which is now unfortunately very common, and even I can be guilty of it, is you want to be doing your best to minimize it, minimize the amount of time you spend on devices, at least an hour before you go into bed. But if you do have to choose. Um, your electronic device, you want to make sure that you have sleep mode on or turn on the blue filter light. Often, I'm not sure about Android, but with iPhone, if you put your phone on uh, low battery, power mode, you'll see that it's not as bright and glaring. And that will also help with the light version as well. Um, actually, one more thing I wanted to talk about in terms of the sleep mode. So with sleep mode, you can also turn it on to help block away uh, certain apps and programs that you're using and that way you won't get notifications. So if you're like going to sleep and someone uh, uh, there's a Facebook notification or someone messages you, the light also won't pop up. So just want to say that. Next, you want to be limiting or even better, avoiding your intake of caffeine, alcohol and tobacco. So caffeine, it's, it's quite obvious. Uh, caffeine is a stimulant and it can interfere with your sleep because it increases your alertness and then it delays the onset of your sleep. So you want to be limiting or avoiding caffeine um, products close to your bedtime and outside of like, the obvious coffee, you have to be um, careful with the caffeine in other products such as like chocolate, some medications out there or even energy drinks. Um, I'll give you an example. I when I go to um, Messina, I love tiramisu ice cream, and I just can't have that at night because then I'll be affected and I just can't sleep. So it's a small things like that you don't realize, rather than like the obvious cup of coffee. Next is alcohol. So when it comes to alcohol, at first it actually may induce drowsiness and make you tired, but then over time it can disrupt the sleep cycle and lead to fragmented and poor quality sleep. So if you do choose to drink alcohol, do some moderation and make sure that you're drinking early in the evening. And you want to make sure that you're allowing your body enough time to metabolize and digest the alcohol in your system. Last but not least is tobacco. So um, in tobacco, you have nicotine and nicotine is a stimulant that can also interfere with sleep, uh, can cause the beauty falling asleep or re lead to restless sleep. Um, but I think it's quite obvious. It's given you you don't want to smoke at all in general. Yeah, but it's one of the things that can impact your health on is sleep. Next is you want to be avoiding having and consuming large meals and excessive fluids before bedtime. So eating large meals and consuming excessive fluids closely at bedtime can disrupt your sleep because it can cause a discomfort or digestive issue or you need to go to the bathroom throughout the night frequently. So digesting a large meal requires more energy and it can lead to discomfort and even indigestion. So it can make it difficult to fall asleep and result in poor quality sleep. So what you wanna do is allow for, in, similar to the alcohol, you wanna allow for enough time for your body to digest um, all your food before you go to sleep. So uh, the recommendation is you wanna be finishing your last meal and also your last um, solid um, water intake or fluid intake about two to three hours before you go to bed. Next is you want to exercise regularly to improve your sleep. Exercise can help with your health in so many ways and sleep is one of them. So 
regular exercise can have a positive impact on your sleep quality and duration as well. It does so by regulating your sleep wake cycles and then it promotes restful sleep. So enhanced deep sleep and REM sleep stages uh, can reduce the symptoms of insomnia as well. Now, when it comes to exercise, it really doesn't matter what type of exercise you do. So when you could be doing aerobic exercise, like cardiovascular exercise, like, like jogging, running, for example. Um, and then you could also be doing resistance training. That's like lifting weights. Um, or even mind-body exercise will improve your sleep as well. So mind-body being like uh, lower gentle exercises like yoga, Pilates, or Tai Chi as well, this can also improve your sleep. Next is stress. So similarly to exercise, stress management can influence your health in so many ways, but stress can significantly disrupt your sleep patterns and quality, and it can contribute to um, having a few having trouble falling asleep, but also staying asleep as well. Um, particularly in the case of insomnia, when someone has prolonged stress, it can lead to insomnia or make the insomnia worse. Um, and it does so by, it creates a cycle of sleeplessness and then you're stuck in this, this state of heightened stress as well. So managing stress is essential for promoting healthy sleep, but also your overall well-being. Um, similarly to exercise, it really doesn't matter what uh, exercise you do. It doesn't matter what you do for stress management as long as it works for you. But if I can give you some, a few suggestions, it um, would be you can practice mindfulness and meditation. There are so many great apps out there that can guide you through, or if not even YouTube. You can practice breath work. Once again, YouTube's amazing for that. Practicing regular exercise. Or even speaking to your family and friends and those around you who you love and trust, asking for support, or if needs be, speaking to a professional counsellor or psychologist, and they can certainly um, help you with stress management as well. All right, last but not least, you want to be avoiding napping. So napping can disrupt the natural sleep wake cycle, and it can interfere with nighttime sleep and lead to difficulties falling asleep and staying asleep. So long but also late naps uh, can decrease your sleep drive and then make it harder to fall asleep at night. So to avoid your napping, you want to establish a consistent sleep schedule to ensure adequate nighttime sleep. Um, and then you want to engage in regular exercise to promote daytime alerts as well. As you can see, everything is all starting to link together. Um, I wanted to say one more thing though about napping. Whilst the recommendation is to avoid napping, I want to acknowledge that in many cultures and parts of the world, including Vietnam, where my family comes from, uh, napping is often practiced because uh, they start their days early and then they finish their days late. And because during the day, it's just way, way too hot to like be out and about doing things. Um, so yes, I want to acknowledge that there is research that uh, napping, also known as siestas, you know, I think in Spanish, I think, um, can improve your alertness and your sleep. But in saying that, no, you don't want to be napping for any more than 30 minutes because more than 30 minutes, you can lead to grogginess. All right. Yeah. Okay. So I hope everyone's still on track. The last thing, one of the last things I wanted to talk about is other uh, ways you can improve your sleep. And one of the ways is through foods. So specifically foods that increase the synthesis of melatonin. Now, what melatonin is, is it's a hormone that helps regulate the sleep-wake cycle. And consuming certain foods can support the synthesis, synthesis and release of melatonin. Now, you can definitely go to the chemist these days without a script and have a chat to the pharmacist over the counter and they can give you melatonin, the hormone in tablet form to help improve your sleep. Um, whilst it is technically natural, if you are looking for a different alternative, then you can consider increasing your melatonin intake, excuse me, via foods. So the first food is nuts, particularly pistachio, because it does contain high levels of melatonin. Next is a Spanish fish. Now, some examples of Spanish fish include salmon, uh, trout, and mackerel. And this is because these fishes are high in omega-3 fatty acids, 
And then what happens is these fatty acids support the production of melatonin. Next is you want to be eating lots of bananas because bananas are a natural source of tryptophan, and that's an amino acid that aids in the synthesis of melatonin. So on top of um, having tryptophan, bananas also contain vitamin B6, along with many other vitamins, but vitamin B6 helps convert the tryptophan into serotonin, which is a precursor for melatonin. Last but not least, goji berries are also great uh, for melatonin. They're nutrient dense and you can consume them fresh or even as a juice instead. Yeah. And I can't finish this presentation as a chiropractor without talking about chiropractic. Chiropractic care is also another regular way of improving your sleep. And I want to explain to you why, if you didn't already know. So this is because your sleep is linked heavily to your nervous system. Now, in your nervous system, it's made up of two. You have your parasympathetic and your sympathetic nervous system, as you can see on the left and the right. So when one's on, the other's off, on, off right? You only, can only be in one state or the other. And what sympathetic is, is, is when you're in a state of fight or flight, you've got to drive, you've got things to do, um, your pupils are dilated, um, you're breathing faster, like you've got things to do. Whereas parasympathetic nervous system is when you're resting, digesting, and you're in relaxation. So when you're sleeping, you're in a state of parasympathetic nervous system. Now, with the chiropractic adjustments, we don't... We can't do, oh, this adjustment for this, this adjustment for that. But rather with chiropractic, it regulates the nervous system so that it regulates the better, healthier uh, levels between the two. So you don't want to be in too much parasympathetic either. You don't want to be sleeping way too much, but you don't want to always be in a state of fight or flight and you can't switch on your parasympathetic nervous system. So yeah, that's what chiropractic does. It regulates the nervous system and allows for uh, healthier or whether it be increase or decrease of more time of your body in the parasympathetic nervous system for sleep. So I want to finish off by reminding you that health isn't about how you feel, right, but rather about how you function and to also remind you that your body has the potential to heal. If you are interested in coming in for chiropractic care, you can contact us uh, on our phone number at 6299 and contact us by, by email. And if you enjoyed tonight's workshop and you're interested in more educational um, material, you can follow us on Facebook as well as subscribe to us on YouTube. We do a workshop every month, I believe next month in July. Dr. Marcus will be talking on the digestive system.